everybody. Thanks for coming. Greg Hughes with Hughes Private Capital. Uh, this has uh, been a lot of fun doing these. I'm glad Stacy was able to replace me last week. So good job, Stacy. Right for everybody who's here. Give her a little, a little hand. My Dodgers did not do what they were supposed to do, but oh well. There's a, I'm, I'll be alive in 29 more years. We'll do it again then. So or maybe next year. So. Um, We've got uh, one more of these coming up next Wednesday, and it's going to be about being the bank and not the landlord. And I think you're going to really enjoy that. If you own any rentals or have owned rentals before or are thinking about owning a rental, um, this is an idea that you might want to look into and something where you don't have to be the landlord and go through all the hassles. You can actually end up being the bank and you can end up... Um, having a mortgage on there and all those hassles and everything go away. Plus you add a whole bunch of certainty to your portfolio because you know what you're gonna be making on that. So we'll talk that through and we'll actually compare the numbers. We'll look at it and say, okay, as a landlord you make this much and as the bank you make this much, where does it come out in the end um, and which one's better, right? And there's not just the numbers, but there's all the emotional side as well with the deal. So we want to again thank Lead Dog. This is a great place to come down here and be. So let's give them a little hand for letting us have the place. Jerry, thank you very much. If you like beer, this place is the place to be. Um, and then again, thank you guys for coming down because any of the proceeds that we collect tonight end up going to the Boys and Girls Club. Um, and so that's, that's a nice deal there as well. So I'm going to be doing tonight, obviously, and then um, I'm going to be doing next week as well. Um, let's see. Let's talk a little bit about Guardian. Guardian is our fund because we're really not going to talk about it at almost at all in the presentation. I just want to give you, for anybody that's new or hasn't had a chance to hear this, we've got a fund that uh, has investors in it that we go out into the Midwest and we buy what we call little starter homes. And the little starter homes... Um, are anywhere from $35,000 to $65,000, believe it or not. And we go then and find a home buyer for that, and we carry the mortgage on that. And then that mortgage goes into Guardian, and that's the way Guardian makes its money, the fund itself. Right now, we've got a return of 10.46% on that. We're shooting for between 10 and 12%, and it will stay pretty much right in that area there. We also do it a different way too, and we're doing more of this. We don't go find so much of the homes that are foreclosed on and that are vacant, but we're actually going out finding homes that are have a tenant in them. And then when we strike a deal to buy that home, we go talk to the tenant and we ask them a few questions. And one question is, are you interested in becoming a homeowner? And if they say yes, then we move forward with that home. The other question that we really like to ask those tenants is, what's wrong with that house? <laughs> Because all those tenants will tell you all the things that are wrong with that house. They are the expert at that. And they'll probably even add a few extra things in there for you. So those are a couple of different models that we have um, in order to go out there and uh, purchase these homes out in the Midwest. Mainly Midwest and Southeastern states. Um, you've got a couple ways to come in to the fund. And we, we're not going to go into all that tonight. But you can come in as actually equity or if you have... Looking for a little bit more safety, you can actually come in as a lender and get paid a fixed rate um, on that deal. So most of you guys are pretty well informed with that. And, and obviously, uh, if you want to talk to me afterwards or get a meeting or whatever, we'd be more than happy to do that. So let's get started with this. I, I'm, I'm really excited about this. It, it, it almost gets better every time I learn something new. So um, about IRAs, and, and that's already happened on this. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna give you a little bonus today um, over and above what we were normally gonna be doing. But one of the things that uh, my daughter Kayla, and most of you guys have had a chance to meet Kayla, raise your hand Kayla. Um, she's been working hard on figuring out what she wants to do from the standpoint of building either a Roth IRA. She's already got a Roth IRA. You already have an inherited Roth IRA. Um, now you're looking towards doing a solo full, solo Roth 401k IRA, right? Is that an IRA, I guess? Yeah. No, or just 401k, I think. Yeah. 
So she's been doing a bunch of research on this, and this has taken quite a while to kind of put all this stuff together. And, and, then, and then we're going to talk about health savings accounts. That's going to be our bonus today. And so another piece that Kayla has been able to put together, um, and, and we're going to go over that in part of this presentation. But it's really, you know, we, we, this is a pretty big statement here. Um, you know, greatest gift to leave your grandchild. You know, obviously, there's a lot of other things like love and memories and everything else than, than, than uh, money and everything like that. But this is really an important or, or powerful, I guess, investing tool that we're going to want to show you how we're going to do it. So, all right, so let's get started. I don't know why I feel so parched tonight. You're going to have to listen to me drink water tonight. Um, so who here really likes to pay taxes? Raise your hand. Raise them really high. Derek likes to pay good. Steve, you do? I want to pay a million dollars. Oh, you're taking away my line, aren't you? <laughs> that was my line. That's right. Nobody likes to pay taxes, right? And I've always said it's my goal to pay a million bucks a year in taxes, right? And, and why would you want to do that? Because, well, that was a heck of a good year. Now, what I'm really the most disappointed about, oh, wrong way. What I'm really the most disappointed about is Bernie didn't get in because Bernie was going to help me get there really fast. So, <laughs> um, and if you, you know, that would have been great. Um, I could have been paying a ton of taxes, but unfortunately that's just not what happened out there, right? So what happens if I were able to tell you that you would be able to give a gift to someone, and we're talking about grandkids, great-grandkids, it be your kids, anybody. It really can be anybody. It doesn't have to be them. We're going to talk about why we talk about some of the younger people of giving this gift. But you gave them a gift that they are able to actually invest tax-free for their entire lifetime. Now think about how powerful that is uh, um, for somebody that you could give that gift to, right? So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And, and what that is called is an inherited Roth IRA. And we'll talk about how that works and, and, and ways that you can make that happen. Um, and, and then you're going to have to also, I'm going to be using the whole time you giving the gift, but really you got to be also thinking about it's your mom and dad, maybe your grandma and grandpa um, that could be doing this. Um, and it could be other people that you just know. So you got to get your head out of just us being the only ones doing it. Okay. Here's my disclosure. It's very long and deep. I had my attorney come up with this um, so that I'm very well protected on this. I am not an expert on IRAs. And the only reason I say that is, you know, don't, and I'm going to tell you everything that I know. And if there's something I can't answer, then I'm going to try to get that answer for you. Um, but there's a lot to these things. And so there's probably, you'll probably come up with a question or two that we just can't answer here tonight. Uh, but we'll, we can go figure it out, okay? So that, that, that part we know. So we're going to start back at the beginning just so everybody's on the same page and everybody knows where we're coming from. Um, and there, there's two types of IRAs. The first one is a traditional IRA. And that one is a one that you put your money in and it's pre-tax. So you haven't paid any money on that tax or any money on any tax on that money. Um, and it goes in. And then when you pull the money out of that, the traditional IRA, then you pay your taxes, right? And then you have the exact opposite, the Roth IRA. The Roth IRA, you pay your taxes up front, and then when you take your money out afterwards, it's completely tax-free. So no matter how much money you made within that Roth IRA, all that becomes tax-free coming out of there. Part of this is also talking about self-directed IRAs. So I, I ask this many, many times during our um, presentations or afterwards or whatever, and I'll say to people, you know, do you have a self-directed IRA? And many, many people say, yes, I have a self-directed IRA because I decide where I'm going to put my money. But it's not really what is normally thought of as a self-directed IRA. And I'll explain that and how that works. So let's say you had your money in Fidelity or Charles Schwab. Those are considered to be custodians. And the custodian if you have it there, decides where you can invest your money. Now, you might say, okay, I got my money in Fidelity, but I can invest it in any stock I want, any mutual fund, any ETF, 
anything that was within those markets, right? And that is sort of self-directed, but it's not truly the definition of a self-directed IRA. What they're not going to allow you to do is they're not going to allow you to invest in something like real estate or something in that respect, right? You can't go to Fidelity and say, I want to take my IRA and invest it into real estate. They, they don't let you do that. So you've got, you got to move it over to a self-directed IRA. That just means that you're going to move it over to something that has, um, it, it's a custodian like IRA services or Quest. It's just like Fidelity or Charles Schwab, but it is, um, it, it's a custodian that will allow you to go out and do that and invest in, say, real estate. Um, and we'll talk about some of all the other things. In all of these, you can do all the different types. You can do an IRA, you can do a Roth IRA, you can do um, the 401k, you can do the health savings accounts, you can do the education savings accounts, okay? So each one of those will allow you to do that. Yes, Scott? On the custodial versus self-directed, are the fees typically the same? Or are we paying more fees because Charles Schwab is taking care of us? Yeah, yeah, so probably Charles Schwab is getting a fee when you're doing a trade of some sort, right? That's the way they make their fees. The other custodians tend to just charge you like on a quarterly basis. Most of the time you shouldn't be paying more than about $250 a year per account. So they're just charging you on, a, on, a, on, on the basis on a per account. Sometimes the transactions you're going to get charged on too with that. But that's the way that those work. Yep, exactly. Okay, so now once you have a self-directed IRA, um, there are restrictions to it. And this is where it does get a little tricky. Um, so what you can't do is you can't do life insurance contracts and you can't do collectibles. So in other words, if you collect Snoopy art and it's fine art for you, um, you can't put that, you can't buy that with your self-directed IRA on that. And then, I'm just going to turn this if that's... Okay, all right, you tell me if it's not. Um, you can't buy diamonds, you can't buy rugs, you can't buy stamps, you can't put a wine cellar in your house and buy all the wine with your self-directed IRA. And the reason being is because that's considered to be self-benefiting. You'd be drinking that wine. So it's basically tangible personal property that you can't put into your IRA. Now what you can't also do is you can't do certain deals with certain people and it's basically your your close family so the green is well first of all that's you right I guess I got a pointer here that's you and anybody that's red like your spouse is somebody that you can't do a deal with um, now your spouse is probably not your best example because you're probably if you're gonna buy a rental home you're buying it with your spouse but um, you, you know, you can't do things with your son or daughter, son-in-law, grandkids, mom or dad, stepdad, grandparents on each side. If they're in the green, as you get outside that, you can do deals. So the perfect example is Kayla. She, when she puts her self-directed IRA together, she can't invest it into one of our funds because she can't participate in something that we're directly related with. So it, it's an interesting thing to look at. And where the, I'll tell you where this comes into, well, we're actually we're going to talk about this in a second. But, but that's the way, so the greens work, the reds don't. You've got to watch that. And otherwise you end up getting in what's called a prohibitive transaction. And you don't want to do that because they can come back and get you for all the stuff that you've done. And you just got to be careful on doing that. So now let's say, because I think this looks like a really nice rental home, right? Nice little vacation home. Uh, you figured, you found this home, you said, you know, this would be fantastic. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go buy that, and we'll, and we'll make it a vacation home, but we'll, we're going to rent it out. That's what we're going to do. We're going to buy it with, with our IRA. Um, but I'm so smart, what I'm going to do is in between when people aren't staying there, I'm going to go stay there. Well, now you've just violated, you've done a prohibited transaction with your self-directed IRA because you're doing what's called self-benefiting. You can't self-benefit from that vacation home there. So same thing if you had just even a rental. You've got to be careful on things that you do with that rental. And it gets almost to the silliness um, of what things become prohibited. So you've got to treat your self-directed IRA as its own entity. It's its own thing. 
and it owns that house, and you can't benefit from any of that stuff. So the other reason they have the deals where you can't go and do something with, say, a son or a daughter, right? Is because, and if you think about this, this is why it, it sort of makes sense. You say, I need to get some money out of my IRA, but I'm not 59 and a half. So how am I going to do that? I know I own this beautiful vacation home that I rent out, and I'm going to have one of my kids go mow the lawn. I'm going to pay my kid $10,000 to mow the lawn, and, I, and, and then after I do that, I'm going to get $9,990 back because I'm very generous and leave them at least 10 bucks for it, right? And then uh, that way I can get money out of my IRA. That's what they're trying to prevent. Does that make sense with that? You know, so they're trying to prevent you from doing uh, certain transactions that you sort The tax man always wants their tax dollars. They're going to get it. Um, and that's what they're trying to prevent when that happens. So there's just some things that you got to really watch with all of that. And then there's some ways to obviously do it a much easier and cleaner way. So actually, let me just go back to the rental house. I want to give you like the dumbest uh, thing you can do not, not, not the, it's, it's the dumbest way to maybe uh, even look at how you could actually violate and do a prohibited transaction. You own a rental house, right? And they call you up and they say, hey, we've got some light bulbs out. And so you run down to Home Depot and you buy light bulbs. And then, so you've already done one transaction because you used your own money to buy something that's going to benefit your IRA. <laughs> Doesn't make sense, does it? And then you run over and you screw the light bulbs in. And now there's a, co there's a cost to that, right? I mean, so you, you provided labor and you did another prohibited transaction. Now, is the government ever going to figure that out? Is you know, the IRS going to probably ever figure that out? Probably not, but I just want to give you that so that you understand sometimes the, the silliness that you can run into when you're working with that sort of stuff. What you can do with your self-directed IRA is go out and you can invest in real estate like we're talking about. You could do oil, gas, venture capital, private lending, whatever sort of outside those realms of what um, you were doing, say, in Charles Schwab or Fidelity. And what I want to make sure everybody understands is there's no law that says Fidelity, you can't allow somebody to go invest in real estate. It's just Fidelity, the custodian, had decided that's not what that's not the business that they're in. So when you go to IRA services or Quest or somebody a custodian like that, that's exactly the business that they're in. That's what they do all day long. And that's all they do. I don't even know if you could invest. I suppose you probably could because you could probably take your self-directed IRA and invest it back into the Charles Schwab account. <laughs> you, you wouldn't want to do this, but and then invest in stocks. I suppose you could do that. So um, but where I want to point out, and, and you know, a little self-serving here, I guess, but that's why you guys are all here, right? I mean, to listen to part of this, is a guardian is a, is a perfect way that if you're doing something with your 401k or your, or your self-directed IRA, that you invest into an LLC. And in that LLC, we own all the rental homes and all the homes with the mortgages and everything else that, that's in there. You'll never have a prohibited transaction because you're not... You're not doing something with somebody that's related. You're not doing something to the home itself. You just invested into the LLC. Super clean way to make that happen. So, okay? All right. Good. Keep nodding. You know, I can see your eyes are like that, but you're nodding. Um, okay. So which is better? Who, who, I want to hear what you guys think. Which one's better? Is a traditional or a Roth a better way to go? Roth. Roth? Roth. Roth. Mm. I think it depends on who's in office. Ah, okay. Nobody's gonna take the traditional. I, I have traditional. So okay. Traditional. Okay. Good. All right. Good. We got a little if, bit if of a. You, if you got a traditional many, 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 many years ago, then that probably is the best because it costs so much. Probably money. true. Yeah, because you'd have to roll it over, right? Okay. Well, we're gonna go through just kind of looking at this and talking about this, and yeah, I mean, you know, we, t Kayla and I were talking today, and I said. My goodness, I mean, she's 25 years old, and she's got all this already lined up, and I'm just thinking, at 25 years old, what an advantage, you know, to go through life and have all that stuff. So all of us didn't always have that chance to be able to do that sort of stuff. Um, 
and it means a lot less to some of us as we, you know, this stuff doesn't always uh, pan out as we get older. All right, so let's just take a look at these. Here's a Roth. We know that if you put $10,000 into your Roth, you've got to pay the taxes. We're going we're gonna to just make our tax uh, bracket 25%. We're going to make it easy. We're going to have to pay $2,500 out, and now we have $7,500 left, right? We're going to take that and we're going to invest it at 10% for 30 years. And when we're done, we have $148,000. All right? So now that's the raw. Now let's look at a traditional. So the traditional is $10,000 in, but no taxes. Same thing. Now we have $10,000 instead of $7,500. 10%, 30 years. We have $198,000 left over, but we got to pay our taxes because when we pull that out, you got about $49,000 in taxes. What's the number? It's identical, right? Mathematically, it's identical. There's no difference between the two on that. Kind of amazing when you, I didn't figure this out until about a year ago. It's like kind of a duh after you look at it on the deal, but mathematically, they're the same deal. So which one then is better out of the two? So, ah, a little change on my slide there. <laughs> Marty stuck one in on me. This is what I say on this. I, I would say the same thing. I'd say a Roth is a better way to go. And the biggest problem is somebody had said, didn't somebody say it depends on who's president? Right? Okay. Right, taxes. So the one thing we don't know, right, all we know is what is today. That's it. And there's no... This was a crystal ball, but now, who is this? I know it's Johnny Carson, but what was his name when he said this? Karnak. Karnak. Karnak, yes. So unless you have Karnak to figure it out, <laughs> um, you know, how are we going to know? So maybe uh, tax rates today are going to be lower than what they will be in the future, vice versa. Uh, the old adage used to be that, well, when you retire, you won't have as much earned income coming in, so your, your tax rate will be less. Well, maybe, but you've also become pretty successful, and you've saved a lot of money, and you've got a lot of money coming in, so maybe you're not that much less, right? You just don't know. And this side of it, with a traditional IRA, you don't know when you're going to be pulling that out, what you're going to deal with. So to me, if mathematically they're both the same, why would you not go with a Roth IRA? where you get to sleep better at night and you know there's no ifs, ands, or buts. When you pull that money out, it is 100% tax-free, right? So that's the way I look at that. Now, there's even another piece to this, and it's really interesting. And I just read a, another thing on this in the Wall Street Journal. I think it was about a month or two ago on this. This is another reason why Roths win. Because you know what happens? Is most people don't take the $2,500 out of the money they're going to contribute. They actually contribute the $10,000 over here to their Roth, so they got a full $10,000 in it, and then they pay the taxes over here outside of that because they're trying to maximize that Roth, right? And so what ends up happening is if you can get that full $10,000 in, you're going to end up having more dollars in the end on the deal. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, Marty. Sure. Twenty five hundred in the beginning, you're making an extra almost fifty thousand at the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. The beauty of compounding, right? Okay. So let's talk about what we came here for, and that was those great gifts, and that is about the inherited Roth IRA. So when somebody passes away and they name somebody as a beneficiary and they have a Roth, that Roth becomes an inherited Roth IRA. That's where that becomes. And when that happens, there's a few rules that the person that is the beneficiary of that has to follow. Um, but this is where the power comes in with this. So the very first thing that happens is depending on your age, and I know there's a bunch of numbers, but it'll make, we'll make it real easy. If you're 30 years old and you inherit it, you take a divisor, which is 50, uh, oh, actually, no, let's make, yeah, let's make it 33, and you inherit it, it's, it's at 50. You take one divided by 50, and it equals 
So what that means is when you inherited that Roth, you have to withdraw a minimum distribution of 2% a year, okay, for that year. And then it keeps changing slightly, but it doesn't go up that much. So just like you have to take a required minimum distribution as you get older, I think it's 70 years old, or is it, is it 70 even, 70. or 70 and a half? Okay, same thing in this deal, right? But here's the kicker. If you inherit this and you're 33 years old, you don't have to wait till you're 59 and a half years old to take any money out. As long as it's been in existence for five years, you can just take all five, or I mean, you can take all the money out of it or just a partial part of it. So you don't have to wait till you're 59 and a half years old. On that. Now what you can't do is you can't contribute to it. You can't go put money back into it. But you can of course take that money that you have in there and now what you have is a lifetime of tax-free investment. I mean, think about that. So, yes? Real quick, because I cheated and I didn't even talk about this, I didn't, I, I wouldn't look some stuff up. Does it have to be five years season before it's inherited? No. Or can you inherit before, but it has to sit for five years? Correct. It's a total of five no matter where it started. Yep, if, if it got done today and the person dies tomorrow, right? and you inherit it, you have to wait the five years. It doesn't matter if they owned it for four years and you inherited it, you would have one year left to, to be have to be able to do that. Yes? And of course, that's based on just the standard IRA. If it's a spread IRA, you designate when they can take it anywhere. The distribution is... I've never heard of a stretch IRA. You've never heard of Never heard of a stretch IRA. See, we so learn something all the time. your heirs. Yeah. And how they can how they, how oh really? You can say they can only take so much here okay. or so much up front or however you want to visit. So you can do that kind of according to how, like you would set it up in your trust type of a deal and do that. That's interesting. Okay, so you could you can add rules to it for the beneficiary. Right. Okay. Stretch out. And only a stretch inherited Roth IRA. Right. <laughs> only certain investments will let you do that in stretch IRA. Oh. Okay. Okay. Can you give us an example of one that would have that would work? I have an annuity that allows stretch IRA to do that. I see. How my, my heirs okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. Good. Some more information on on knowing another deal to do that. Okay. So as you as you can see, as you're if you're age one, and by the way, a person that's one years old, one year old, um, can inherit to a Roth IRA, right? And so again, that gives that that child a, a, a chance to invest that money for the rest of their life. That That is an extremely powerful deal. Now, there is one caveat. If you were to inherit a Roth IRA at 111 years old, you have to distribute 100% of it at that moment, okay? Just so you know. So you guys can kind of plan forward on that. Isn't she a cute little grandma on that? Okay, so let's look and see what tax-free investing means to us. Really, when you talk about taxes, they're almost your largest expense within an investment. Right? I mean, you may have expenses within the investment itself, but for that investment, your largest expense most of the time, it's not going to be like paying for your self-directed IRA. That's not going to be your paying expense. It's going to be paying those taxes. So, uh, so if you were to inherit one of these at 10 years old here, and we started with $10,000, 10%, and we have an income tax rate of 25, we go 10 years, and when you're 20 years old, assuming you, you know, probably don't have a tax rate of 25%, so don't anybody tell me that, okay, at 10 years old, but we're using this as the example. At the end, when you're 30, you're going to have 28 grand left, and you're going to have 22,000 if you had to pay your taxes. So you're already starting to see a little bit of a difference, right? And if we move that out further, we know as we continue to compound that money, as we reach 30 years old, now I've got 74,000 tax-free, 
And if I had to pay my taxes, I've got 45,000. So pretty big difference there, right? And if I move that out even further, it gets big. I mean, really big, right? And I know these numbers sort of get silly, right? I mean, but it, it, it drives home the point. I mean, it's not unrealistic to think that at your 60 years old, you've actually, what is that, quadrupled the amount of money that you have in there. I mean, it's amazing. And, and that's the power of the inherited Roth IRA. Okay. So, it does not matter what your family tree looks like, okay? You probably have a better looking one than this one. Um, when you go about doing this, now that you've listened to this and you've kind of seen how this works here, um, who would you want to be the beneficiary? You want somebody at the youngest age possible. So hopefully we all pass away sometime when we're 90, 100 years old, right? Somewhere in that range would be a great life. Well, how old are your kids? <laughs> They're like 75. So giving them an inherited Roth IRA isn't really that big of a deal. They're like, yes, yeah, so what? I uh, not only have enough money myself, but I could take the distribution out whenever I wanted. So, you know, it really doesn't matter. So when you're thinking about this, you want to think about where do you want it to go? And, and you, you probably already know this, but it obviously doesn't have to be family either. It can go off and it can be friends or, or whoever. Or, um, probably could be a charity, you know? You could give it away to, as a, to a charity um, or something like that. But you want to get it usually to the youngest people. So if you've got an estate, you might want to take your Roth IRA, um, or if you're getting an inherited, and make sure that it's getting to the youngest people that can benefit for the longest um, for that. Um, there's another way that you can do an inherited Roth IRA. And so we're not going to go into that. I'd rather do it in a um, private conversation. Uh, but so if you if you think because I mean right now we're talking about having somebody that has it and then they've got to pass away, right? So the, those are things that are going to happen in the future. There's a way to actually do an inheritor or get an inherited Roth IRA. That's a way that Kayla got hers um, by not. It's been done that way, but I just would rather talk about it in private. So if you have interest in that, um, make a time and we can talk and. And we'll, we'll go over it. Yes? Brenda, I, I, I thought about this. I thought about it both for my college age kids, but maybe their children to pass it on. But even my college age kids, let's say they inherited a Roth IRA, are not smart enough to use that money right today. Can you get it into a trust so they can't so blow it that you're directing, or does it have to go to them? Well, I think that legally it has to go to them. So this may be one of the questions that I don't know how to answer. That's okay. Um, but I've got four kids, and Kayla knows all about this because she's really responsible. Um, not all of my kids know that they have an inherited Roth IRA. <laughs> gotcha. So that's another way to sort of do it. Um, you could help them. Yeah, basically you could help them to... to work it and maybe without them even knowing about it. Yeah. Or having access to it. Yeah. I'm sure you can figure out some way to do that. Yeah. So we have not started working the inherited Roth IRAs that we have right now. So it, it's it's new for us. Um, but yes, not all kids will understand where they are and how to get to them. <laughs> It'll be in the inherited Roth safe. <laughs> yeah, Marty. Um, yeah, probably let's let's uh, let's keep going with it, and then we'll 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 try to get the things done at the end. Okay, so okay, all right. So that is the inherited Roth side. So here's your little bonus tonight. We're going to talk about health savings accounts. So probably, I mean, I'm just kind of curious. Have you guys all heard about these? I mean, maybe a little show of hands. Like, if you all you you know something about them. Who here has? Okay, so Doug and Michael, and I can't see through the light there, but who has one there? Donna. 
Okay, so <laughs> it's hard to see. I can't see anything. I just see a shadow over there. Rhonda. Oh, Rhonda. Okay. Okay, Rhonda Donna. Um, no, Rhonda's got one. Okay, so you got, so we got three people in the audience that have one of these. I've been interested in these for a long time, and I have to give all this credit to Kayla again because she's been out researching these things and figured them out, and that's why we, we literally added this uh, just yesterday to the PowerPoint um, as we're doing this. These things are incredible. I, I just can't get, either we're not figuring something out, we've got something wrong, so there's my disclosure there, um, or people are just not thinking about how to use these things. So I'm gonna give you the quick and the dirty on these things right now, and because and, it's not all that um, complicated. So here's the beauty. You get an HSA, a health savings account. By the way, you would do this now, Doug just told me he did it at a bank, which I've never heard of before, so that's one option at Umqua Bank. I would do it in, in my head, and I think that's the way we'll go. We're going to get one of these. We'll put it into one of the custodians like Quest or IRA or IRA services so that we can take that and invest it, and we can invest it in uh, things that we do. So, we, we, you know, like in other words, if I want to go buy a house in the Midwest with my uh, HSA account, I can go do something like that. Um, and so what's the am amazing part is that anything that goes into the HSA is tax-free. And everything coming out of it is tax-free. So think about that one, right? So traditional IRA get taxed on the end, Roth IRA get taxed up front. This one you can be tax-free on both sides. Now, the rule becomes that you've got to use it to, for medical purposes. But the medical purposes are huge. I mean, I don't even know if you're going to be able to read this, but I just wanted to put it together. There you go. Get started anywhere in there of what you can use this for. That's a lot, a lot of different things there. In there, yeah. And, and Greg, one of the things, and one of the reasons I invested in my HSA, because I don't know if it's even listed in here, but we know it won't be there when we get there, but we're hoping it will. But this can pay your Medicare Part A, B, C, D, I don't even know all those, but you can pay those premiums with your HSA. So if, if when, once we have retired, and work on the federal goal, if you will, and maybe you need these other extra prescription plans, et cetera, they have premiums. You can pay for those premiums in addition to these items out of that HSA account. Yeah, cool, very cool on that. So let's just talk about how this works. You open up an account, and I'm, I'm gonna, next slide, we're gonna show you some details here, but I'm just gonna give you the concept. You open up an account, you start putting money in there. If you can, then you, what you want to really do is start to take that account and invest it. Invest that account and don't use any of the money to pay for your medical. All you have to do with your medical stuff is start keeping track of it. So keep the receipts, do, the, uh, do an electronic uh, receipt keeper or whatever you call that. You can hang on to them forever. You could do it 20 years later. Whenever you're ready, you go back to your HSA account and you can then pay yourself back for all the medical stuff that you've done. Now, I used to have a thing in my head that you had to do it all by the end of the year. I haven't read that anywhere. You haven't read that, right, Kayla? So hopefully we're right on that, right? It just goes, right, Doug? It just keeps rolls going. Over. My account rolls over each year. Rolls over. So if every year you can start getting money into that account and you can actually let that account build on itself and you don't pay any of your medical out of there so you're compounding your money, then you're going to be in great shape um, for doing that. Does that make, make sense, right? I'm, I, this is my first time going through this, so I want to make sure that you know this is not confusing. Then you've got all these different types of deals that you can, you can write or deduct, I guess, and have your HSA uh, pay you back for it. Yes, David? Now, are all these uh, procedures, they have to be done on yourself, not on your children, not on anybody else in your family, it has to be on yourself? Like, instead of tuition, so you couldn't apply that to your yeah. family. 
So it depends on which HSA you have. You actually have, um, so let's just flip, flip to the next slide here. You actually have two ways to do it. You can do it as an individual or as a family, okay? So it, let's just talk individual. So you, the first thing you have to do is you have to have a high deductible health plan. And so it's got to fit in here. You've got to have at least a deductible of $1,300 and out of pocket, pocket max of $6,500. Your, your health plan has to fit into this. And this may be one of the reasons why it doesn't fit for everybody. Maybe if you're at work or somebody and you're getting your health care through them, maybe they don't even offer that. So that's a possibility, right? So, so, so Greg, that's what I was mentioning earlier before we the talk. Yeah. Is my max out of pocket is greater than the 13K uh -huh. for the family. Right. And so technically, and there are health plans that do that. You don't need the minimum and you don't need the maximum. And the government's punishing you and saying, well, you can't have a health savings account because you're above the maximum. Mm. Okay. I'm just waiting to get caught. Yeah. Well, that, that, is another, <laughs> that is another piece of it, truly. Yeah. Um, and then uh, as a family, you, you know, you can see this game, uh, again, the same thing, the deductible and out-of-pocket max. Now, here's the contributions. So as an individual, you can put $3,400 in. If you're 55 and older, you can put $4,400 in as a max, 6750 as a family. So, David, back to your question a little bit there, right? So, I, I would do it as a family, and then what I was reading on the IRS website today is that as long as my kid, there, there's different rules, so some of them will say, um, and they can fall under all different ones. So it might be going to school full time, um, and they're under 24, they fall into the HSA. Um, if they live in our house for more than half of the year, um, if, they, if we support them for X amount or whatever it was. There was a lot of different ways, and it seemed to be pretty general that you could make that work um, for that. And then, of course, the other way, where Kayla wouldn't fall into that with us, but she will start her own HSA, um, and partly because you're doing all your own stuff anyways, right? So you were just raising your hand. That's right. You had said that today. So yeah. Dependent has to live with you though. Right. right. It's the normal IRS. Age. It varies. It's sixteen. Yeah. 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 So live with you. You have to pay for however much they're lodging and living. Yeah. If you need to defend it, I'll sign up. I want to be a defendant. You're a very sensitive. No. So I, I don't know about you guys, but again. I was pretty excited about the inherited Roth IRA. You know, that was pretty cool. This is like a really cool cousin. Yeah. And if not, if, if not even more so, um, it's one of the things, you know, how do we get an inherit? I mean, I know we talk about it and we said we'll talk about kind of their private, how you can do, get it in a different way. But really an inherited Roth IRA, somebody has to die, right? And that's no fun, especially if it's you, right? That really doesn't make it fun. So, um, this is a way that you can go tax-free in and tax-free out. So as long as you're taking that money out for medical purposes and back to that list, you're, you're all set. And, and the only thing that you can't do, and we're not sure exactly where this line is drawn, but in the IRS thing it says that you can't go back any further than the first year that you have your HSA account. So if you open in 2017, you can't pay for medical past that. There's a possibility that it could be, you can't even pay for anything in the past the day you open your HSA account. But we're not sure. It, it, again, if you read the IRS rules, it, it says anything for more than that year's worth of time uh, on the deal. So, I mean, other than that, everything going forward, you can save it, build that, that fund up, and then there's one more kicker to all this. And actually, I thought that was on this slide, but I think it went away, Marty. Um, was our FICA, our FICA. So, well, there's, there's, oh, it's right here. Okay, okay, you moved it. I, you know, I can't see it. Um, so, uh, I, I'm not good with change, Marty. So, um, so if you pay yourself, so, so you got two things that are going on. The first thing is, 
putting money in and obviously you're saving on the income tax, right? You're not, you're not having to pay income tax. But the second part is if you can do this through payroll and you put your entire contribution in through payroll, then you're gonna save your side of the FICA tax. So you're gonna save another 7.65%. So I mean, on, on something of, of $6,700, that, that's a couple thousand dollars a year in savings, maybe even a little bit more, again, depending on what tax bracket you fall into and everything else. So, I don't know, are you guys excited about this? You guys are just like, all right, okay, I don't know. I mean, you're kind of like, okay, whatever. But I mean, I'm pretty dang excited. I keep telling Kayla, I can't believe this is out there and people are not doing this. So here's the last bit about it. What happens if you don't use it? It all reverts back into the guardian fund. And it's kind of an amazing thing how that works. But it's a little state law that we had written up. And, and uh, no, you just, it, now what happens is it just becomes a traditional IRA. And the only thing that's different is you can't take the money out until you're 65 instead of 59 and a half. But you don't lose a single thing on the deal. If you don't use it for medical, you just start paying your taxes as if you put it in pre-tax and took it out in a traditional IRA. But that's it. So, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a great little deal there. So that's it. Questions, you guys have been doing a good job of asking questions all the way through. But if I understand correctly, Greg, even if you're over 65, you can still use it to pay medical, and that's still tax. Correct. Right? Yes. Yeah. And it, it, so if, this, if it's right. paid for that Social Security right. or long-term care or anything else that you need, that's tax-free. Yeah. I would. I would sort of venture to guess that most of these, at some point, but just. But if we invest in Guardian, it'll be billions. There'd be billions, so we'll right? Pull it out. Right, and, and you're gonna have a problem. Then you got to manage your money because, and that's hard. That's not easy to do. Manage billions, you know. So, yeah, yeah. What's that? That's right. You finally get to pay a million bucks in taxes. Doesn't matter who's in your office. <laughs> You'll be paying it, Steve. So you're putting your money into an HSA. Who's the custodian account? What can you use it for as far as investments? So I think this is again where where everybody sort of has you know I mean myself included until we sort of looking at this you want to actually think of this as just like a regular Roth IRA or regular traditional IRA you just take it you open it up with one of the custodians that allows you to invest it wherever you want to invest it right and then that's all you do that's it so you just start feeding that thing as fast as you can get your money in there and then um, started getting invested, and then you know getting it built up to what you can get it built up to um, on the deal. So your fees are they exorbitant? Are they? Well, most of the time on, and I'm not sure if an HSA is more or less. It's probably about two to three hundred dollars a year. I've got one quote so far that was 125 bucks a okay. year, and then they had different transaction fees, like maybe each time you uh, write a check, it's 15 bucks. Uh huh. Right. If you did a transaction or something like that, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. I think there's a limitation, though. Maybe some correct me, but when I've done research on HSAs, you have to have an insurance policy that will allow the HSA. Right. Yeah. So that's yeah. It's back, to, it's back to that one there. So you just have to have the high deductible. I'm not 100% sure what this, the out-of-pocket max, I don't know where or how that comes into it. I think a little bit like what Doug was saying. I gotta tell you, some of this stuff, we, we know some people in the industry, and I'll just say it this way. What I have learned is from one of the custodians that I know, they've never even audited an HSA account. In all the history of all the time that they've had them and they've done all these. now. That is never to tell you to go run out there and do things the wrong way. But there could be ways that you could, you know, I mean, maybe not worry about every, you know, like if, are you hitting those perfectly or not? Um, and I'm assuming those are gonna change at times too. So, you know, that's probably bad advice, but I try to be realistic. <laughs> and I'm not a CPA and I'm not an IRA guy and all those other things that go along with that. So, there, you can't sue me, ha. <laughs> All right. I think they need some more beer, Derek. I mean, they're, they're like, I got, 
I might have missed this part. Okay. So on the HSA, are you able to, first say you do well off the life and business and stuff and you don't need to use it. Yeah. Are you able to roll that over to do a Roth where you can pass that money on? It just ends up becoming a traditional IRA. Oh, it does. So if you never used it for any medical, which of course you're going to no matter what, at some point, even though you've built it up to say hundreds of thousands of dollars, you, you know, you're going to write some of it off because you'll keep all your medical stuff and you know, you'll have some medical, I, I would think. And then if you don't, whatever you don't use, you, you can just, you'll take it out, but it becomes taxed, okay. just like a traditional IRA. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's it. Unless you guys got more. One more, one more. One more, okay. Can't see you back here, but okay. Let's say that you've got the HSA through work. Yep. You're going to retire in a year or so. Can you continue to contribute to? Yes. Should be able to because it has nothing to do whether you're working or not. The only thing is, is if you're doing it through your payroll right now, so you're getting that FICA ad advantage. If you are done working, you can now still contribute to the HSA. You just won't have the payroll advantage. So you just take your own money, any kind of earned income that you'd have. Well, no. It, well, yeah. If, but but if you've got any kind of monies that would be taxable, right? And you're gonna have some, of some sort, um, I would think, then that you should be able to deduct that out of your, whatever your gross income would be for that year. Now, I don't know how that works against dividends and all that other stuff, you know, on that. But, but you just would lose the payroll side of it, just the, the FICA side. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Stacy. No, it's not the insurance. You just have to have an insurance with the deductible like oh, that. Okay. Yes. So you just have to be in an insurance program that has those deductibles. And is it outside of your insurance then? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it's a comp think of it again just as its own account. And so if you're, say, with IRA services, you're going to have your own HSA account just there. And you're just going to contribute to that and then try to get some of the payroll in there as well, or do it all through payroll. Um, and then it will be its own entity there in that so IRA that service. So you go to open up an HSA is through an IRA company? Yep, exactly. Well, you don't have to. Doug did it at Umpqua Bank. I did mine at Umpqua. Before that, I did it. It was a bank first. This is being out of Chicago. And the one out of first Chicago will actually let you then take it if it grows. You know, you've got to have a little bit of money there. And you can start investing into mutual funds and other things for like a custodial account, kind of like having a kind of account swap. Yeah. So you can invest it there. But I'm probably doing some other friendly things for me, so I talk to people over there. Are there minimums? Like, do you have to contribute a certain amount each year? I don't think no, so. There's no minimum, but there's the maximum. Right, and and then the other piece would be if, if you young, uh, if you obviously well. If young boy, I'm just gonna say if you have young boys, you will burn through it. You are every day. You're you're gonna yeah. burn through it. Yeah, we would have used a few of those for a yeah. couple of the emergency but if, but trips. If, but if you're fairly healthy, you won't even you won't burn through it all, and then it starts to build up. Yeah. Well, it was amazing. But what I didn't know and, and this that you can say it is we use ours all the time. All of our co-pays are paid through our HSA. I'm like, oh wait, I can leave it there and let it grow tax free. Yep. And but save I all that. I haven't invested because if I'm fall, I can't. You know, it's just right. a little bit of interest, like what is that, 0.1% <laughs> is what they're paying today or something stupid. So it's, so I don't have to make a self-directed. So I can't invest it in something that will actually grow. And I didn't know that I could save those receipts and, and, and do them 20 years from now. Yeah. That makes a huge difference. Does. I, I think that's the big differentiator that you're talking about here. Yeah, where well, you can grow a, an account tax-free, right? In and out. Yeah. I also just want to make note of the one slide that showed all of the different services. That's what kind of blew me away. When I was talking to Kayla, we were talking about it in the meeting, all the different things that are health-related that you wouldn't Consider that you can use that money. So what Greg was saying, which is, you know, it's it's loose 
ish in terms of what you consider health related. But I'll give you an example. I mean, Gre Greta will like this one here lead based paint removal. So, for all those old homes in Southwest yeah. Reno, I mean, think about that's pretty broad. Seriously, if you actually look at this list, you will be astounded. Um, and I think it might be worth, if, if anyone wants a copy of this, at, you know, afterwards, we're more than happy to give it to you. It's on there. I used to take them on eyeglasses. So, these came out, I don't know, they're $300 frames because it's just stupid, but so they charge the frames. It costs more than microwave oven, but yet they have a lot less than us. You know, and, and glasses. And, and the other thing, too, I'm, I'm a Sam's lover. We still go there for our prescriptions. It always comes back, you want cash on. In fact, the other day, um, I, I just, all I did was go over to the <laughs> and I the pharmacy buying my drugs. I rang it all up, and it all went through my HSA. Bring it on, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because all of this is recorded right now. <laughs> But I did use my HSA because I, I wanted, you know, I've been deodorant and aspirin in my prescription. Right. And I, I'm on the prescription, I don't know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> and, they're, they're not. And, and, and the point was, you know, something qualified, and even the aspirin qualified, so I don't have to prescribe, take the aspirin for them. Because I can't take one. And is the deodorant a medical condition of yours, Doug? Yes, it stinks. Most of uh, Yeah, I that's what I thought. It's, it's my doctor thinks I smell. So, yes, it's a medical <laughs> Yes. David, look like you had a question. Yeah, I do. So I had one of these with Wells Fargo previously, and uh, the benefit to it was basically um, tax-free. It was a tax shelter, so mm -hmm. I didn't have to pay taxes on the money that I had in the account. I used it on qualified expenses, yada, yada. But I wasn't able to correct it at more aggressive investing other than just getting, you know, you know, a third over prime, something like that. Right. That's so, why you got to get so in self-directed. Yeah. Account. I mean, can you, with, with my TRO price account, can I do an HSA there and be more aggressive with the investments, or is it really just? Yeah, a you can do it that way. You can go put it in T row and, and throw it into a mutual fund if that's what you want to do, or you can put it into a custodian that allows you to invest in other things, right? Mm -hmm. So you could even be more so, aggressive. With so T row might not do health savings accounts. Where I was with, with this first uh, first American out of Chicago, they'll let you do a mutual. Is that a bank or is it still real? It's a bank. Like, See, because I did a Wells Fargo account, and there weren't, there weren't any uh, investment choices. It was basically right. It was basically a, a, a an account. It's open. Account. Yeah. Yeah, but it was a tax shelter as well, and it's very informative the list you have because there are a lot of things on the therapy. There's you know all kind of tuition, a lot of things that. That you wouldn't consider health benefits right. that you know you can spend on. Exactly. Okay, Steve. Okay, so I don't have an HSA, but mm -hmm. let's say I did take one out, mm -hmm. and I wanted to get a good rate of return on that, something better than the bank base. Yeah. If I wanted to get that into Guardian, how what steps would I have to go to make that happen? So you would open the account and then you would invest it just like you're going to do. Or didn't you do it? Who do I open the account with? Though? Well, you would open it with, well, Stacy would help you, but you'd open it with whatever custodian you want. IRA services is probably the least expensive, the best customer service. Um, and you would just simply open it there. You'd have an HSA account and then you would direct them to invest that into Guardian. So that'd be the way to do it. Yeah. So your only challenge is when you open your very first one, you can't get probably more than sixty-seven hundred fifty dollars in there, and you're going to be paying you know two three hundred bucks a year on some fees. But obviously, you know, as long as you're making more than that and building it up over time, it will be worth it. You know, so kind of Kayla. Um, just the other thing that's kind of nice about it that makes it because sometimes when you're doing transactions with your IRA, you know, it takes a lot of time, you have to go have to do paperwork. But with this, I mean, you just get, you get checks, that's optional, and oh, that's someone right. can give you a debit card. So literally, when you're at the doctor's office, you swipe your card, and it's done. But you don't want to spend any of it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so sort of defeats a purpose. Yeah. Okay, I failed to mention that John Trevere is in the house. And a lot of you guys have had a chance to meet John. <laughs> and
and lovely Michelle. Michelle, I'm not leaving you out, but John was the one that did the interview on the reverse mortgages. So both of those guys do mortgages. They're awesome at what they do. And they came and talked to us if you didn't have the chance to listen to it about reverse mortgages. And so I just want to point them out. And if you do have some questions, they're here to uh, get them or get, get your questions answered. All right, any other questions? All right, if you guys applaud for me, I will get off the stage. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.